Corey McGuire is a lecturer in 20th century British history at Durham University. Her first book, Measuring Difference, Numbering Normal, Setting the Standards for Disability in the Interwar Period, combined history of medicine, science and technology studies, and disability history. Her talk is entitled, Investigating Categories in the Treasury of Human Inheritance. Hi, I'm Dr. Corrie Maguire, and I work at Durham University. And I want to start off today by asking you to imagine a scene, something like the one that's pictured here on the screen. Um, so what we can see here is the interior of a home in Britain in the early 1940s. Um, people are taking drinks in the dining room or perhaps the sitting room. So I want us to imagine something like this, but in our imagined picture, it's 1943 and a mother is watching a child drink from a cup. Every day she observes the way that the child holds the vessel and she's checking to see if they start to develop, quote, a little trick in the use of their arms that she's seen her older children employ to help them to drink more easily. She tells the woman who is visiting her home that she recognizes that this adaptive move is the first signal, the first evidence of the impact of, quote, the disease common to members of her family. This visitor was Dr. Julia Bell, and she's pictured here on screen as a young woman graduating. And she used this information to analyze the mean age of onset of disease for the different genetic classifications of pseudohydrotrophic pseudo and allied types of progressive muscular dystrophy that she had developed. Julia Bell had started work on biometrics in 1908 under the supervision of Carl Pearson after taking a degree in mathematics from Cambridge University. She was an integral statistician in the Treasury of Human Inheritance project from 1909 onwards. Although when the First World War broke out and work on the Treasury ceased, Bell went to the Royal Free Hospital in order to obtain her medical degree, and she only returned to the Galton Laboratory in 1920. She then worked under the supervision of first Ronald Fisher, then Lionel Prenrose, and was responsible for writing altogether 13 volumes of 24 of the Treasury projects. So what was the Treasury? It was an extensive compilation of genetic disorders published between 1909 and 1958. It included published and unpublished family pedigrees designed to provide material that would illustrate human inheritance for students of hereditary. It formed part of a much broader connected body of research into inheritance in the first half of the 20th century, which was administered by multiple institutions. A major part of Bell's work involved verifying the family pedigrees that had been collected using data from individuals, doctors, specialists, academics, and various social and medical institutions across Britain. So it meant that she had to validate the data that had been collected from families to create these pedigrees whenever it was possible, which required a sensitivity to the domestic world that might well have seemed to be more appropriate for a woman to do, as is suggested by Margaret Rossiter's theory of territorial discrimination. So for an example of how this worked, we can see on the two tables on the screen here, how Bell was tabulating the influence of the category of parenthood um, and using that to work out the emergence of hereditary disease. So on the, the first table, uh, table four, um, that's on the top of each image, you can see that it demonstrates a higher age of onset for parents rather than singles. And then table five underneath gives the mean age of onset and age of death in the different cases under discussion. So verifying the correlations between such potentially social factors and tracing the relationship to inherited factors linked to the individual was a really crucial part of Julia Bell's work. She investigated things like parentage, but she also looked at diet, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, and breastfeeding. 
She investigated how gender affected caregiving norms and what that meant for health. She looked at the tendency and the ability to conceal disability. She looked at barriers to marriage, as well as class, education and institutionalization. This was critical to her struggle to demarcate genetic influences from environmental conditions. So for instance, Bell noted in the same volume that these tables are from, that, quote, it is difficult to say how much of mental backwardness can be attributed to a lack of independence and lack of stimulus to activity of any sort, resulting from the conditions under which the patient must, must live. She explained the pressing need to understand how disability and disease were, quote, reacted upon by economic and social conditions varying from one period to another or from one country to another. This was also linked to the related need to sort the relative importance of different individuals' genetic susceptibility due to their categorization as part of a group from their ways of living as a member of that group. So, for instance, Bell's work involved establishing the apparent impacts of, quote, sex-linked sex conditions from the effect of gendered norms. She ex also explained the pressing need to clarify why there was, quote, a very marked difference between the values of sex incidents for, between the Eastern and the Western races. So what's critical here is that she wasn't just trying to statistically track race and sex linked conditions. She was investigating why these conditions emerged in the way that they did and questioning the categories that she was using to organize her data. And it's analysis of these categories that I'm principally concerned with. And on the screen here, we have an extract from one of her 1932 reports where she's talking about um, why congenital dislocation of the hip should occur more in females um, and cases of cervical ribs as well. Cervical ribs, I think. Um, and also talking about cases in children. And of course, children um, versus adults is another category that she's concerned with. Um, establishing more correctly. So as I said, it's analysis of these categories that I'm principally concerned with. Public health, um, more generally in 20th century Britain, developed these kinds of epidemiological categories precisely in order to establish whether there was a relationship between lifestyle and health. And by the 1930s, there was a real increased focus on the role of the environment on health in the laboratory, um, partly due to the shift from mainline to reform eugenics. And you can really see this shift having been reflected in, in Bell's work. Um, so, for, for instance, um, Bell was concerned that sex differences in glaucoma were not due to, quote, vasomotor instability in women at certain periods of life, as has been supposed, but rather the result of gender differences like, quote, the tendency amongst women to neglect minor symptoms. However, what's really interesting is that Bell reverses this causation when she's considering racial differences um, in the same condition in glaucoma in response to the point that greater propensity among, quote, Jewish people, an actor's category at that time, to glaucoma was due to greater diligence in seeking care. She argued that, that this actually demonstrated proof of a, quote, Jewish genetic predisposition to nervousness, which then precipitated the disease. Studies of epidemiology more broadly have emphasized that these kind of categories are cultural artifacts often linked to the politics of inequality. As Ted Porter has recently put it, quote, human genetics could never be confined to the laboratory. And analyzing these kinds of examples reveals how power influences categorization decisions and how the categories used in genetic research, including race, gender, and class were constructed in order to establish disability. And on the screen here, we can see an example of one of the kinds of pedigrees that they're using. They, they look very similar to the pedigrees you would see today. Um, it's, it's a little bit blurred out, but you get the general idea, I, I hope, of what they were trying to do. And what I'm trying to show with this is that disability was thus central to British eugenics in the interwar period in, in a way that's not always been reflected in the historiography of the topic. However, historian Michael Rembis has long stressed that disability was central to the evaluated nature of eugenics. While Marion Schmidt's recent work has shown that foregrounding disability within genetics, quote, blurs the boundaries between eugenics and medical genetics. Genetic researchers firmly delineated their work from eugenics after the Second World War. 
But in the interwar era, these two fields were much more entangled in Britain, although they were opposed on significant points such as sterilisation programmes. But disability was central to eugenics, not just because disability was the fundamental outcome that scientists sought to curtail. It was only through study of mutated genes that researchers could attempt to understand normal function. So disability was central to eugenics as a necessary concept, as a motivation and a problem. But I want to zoom out again from the historiography now and come back to consider what this process of investigation was like for the families that Bell worked with. So I'm not just interested in the, the mother watching, but it's the child holding the cup that we're really interested in, as well as the relationship between the two. But what kind of methodologies can we use to try and recover these kinds of lived experiences from these kinds of very scientific sources? I want to suggest that if we amalgam amalgamate free interrelated historiographical strains, we can address the creation of disability as a quote, scientific fact. Um, it's a reference to, to Ludwig Fleck's work. So the first strand relates to work in medical history that pushes back against the source's context to recover the patient voice from medical records and turn the object into the subject. Such an approach can involve recovering voices verbatim from the source itself, even though their perspective is being framed by the researcher. Second, on the screen already, STS and Scott social construction of technology approaches that can work to reveal the user rather than the designer in studying scientific artifacts. And this approach is one that has been extended to disability objects by historians such as Beth Williamson, who've demonstrated that, quote, disability things often defy the intentions of their makers. And I think this is a really interesting way to think about some of the examples of disabled innovation listed in the Treasury volumes. And these examples are often coming um, more so in the footnotes than in the actual text itself. But if we take just a 1928 volume, there's numerous examples of disabled innovation that the families discuss, ranging from a vegetarian diet to prosthetics such as a crutch or a stick, ear trumpets, spinal jackets, and so on. Reframing patients as users in this way can add to historians' efforts to recover patient voices by considering experiences that took place outside clinical encounters, offering access to the experiences of those who did not consider themselves patients. Thirdly, approaching the archive itself as a kind of classificatory force allows us to work out what kinds of systems and structures sorted the relative importance of different individuals' genetic susceptibility from their categorization as part of a group, which is the kind of crux of this project. And to do this, I, I want to engage with scholarship from history of science in particular, that was worked on things like measurement, like statistics and classification systems. These kinds of histories really rest on the premise that science itself is social in a way that the social medical binary model that disability history is built on has occasionally tended to obscure. And although the treasury of human inheritance might seem like a really unusual source to kind of read against the grain to recover disabled experiences, partly because of its sheer size, I think you can find that there are assorted showers of material about disabled people's lives and their family relationships can be kind of collected and fused into an original and a cohesive mosaic. So for example, to come back again to this 1928 volume that I mentioned on blue sclerotics and fragility of bone, um, it's not a very good picture on the slide there. It's a little dark, but it just shows the front page of the issue. Um, and in this issue, Bell was attempting to identify the onset of several clinical symptoms that might be related to the genetic condition in question. So if you read along the grain, these are examples of medical case studies. But if you read against the grain, they provide fascinating glimpses of the diversity of disablement and its management within families, including indications that many affected individuals considered their condition to be a good thing. So for instance, Bell described how one man with hyperextensibility of ligaments, common in association with blue sclerotics, that's a quote, used his extensibility to make a living as, quote, an acrobat on the stage, who stated that he could do, quote, loopings in the air. This framing suggests that he considered his condition to be a positive asset. And similarly, Bell tells us one woman, quote, volunteered the statement that her three children were all born with eyes just like hers, but the eldest lost the blue in the first year of life. 
This unsolicited description of the children's eyes as just like hers suggests pride in their similarity to herself, and the use of the word lost indicates that what Bell regarded as normalization or cure of a quote defect was regarded by the mother as a loss. Other women, such as the 29 year old who acerbically commented that, quote, she was aware that my eyes are of great interest to nearly every doctor I meet, articulated a kind of ambiguity around desirability and normative appearance to reveal a clear tension between the clinical gaze and lived experience. This tension could become active resistance, such as in the case of a man who argued with Bell that he did not have bone fragility and that all his fractures occurred from severe injury. In such examples, we see the clinical gaze reflected back onto the viewer, and this pushback against the non-disabled white heterosexual context of this source enables us to reframe, recontextualize, and rewrite these stories from a disability history perspective. And furthermore, I contend that a disability history approach shows how power was part of the struggle to establish disease causation as either environmental or genetic through the investigation, identification and separation of biological categories from lifestyle factors. Such a move will show how disability acted as a kind of meta-analytic category that sat on top of and organised and gave credence to these other salient categories. And this will not only contribute to the history of eugenics, but also consider a set of ideas and practices that were enmeshed with eugenics, that is the notion that bodies could and should be categorised to show health and risks to health as originating in the individual rather than in ways of living. So analysing inheritance in the context of 20th century genetics reveals how both disability and eugenics relate to this history of categorising inequality through obscuring the relationship between the environment and the individual. And this is essentially the focus of my forthcoming project when categories constrain care, investigating social categories and health norms through disability history, 1909 to 1958, which I'm going to start work on in 2023, thanks to a Welcome University Award. And the sources that I've discussed here today represent just a very tiny portion of the material that's available on this subject and that I plan to research. For instance, there's a huge amount of digitised material online thanks to UCL's Legacies of Eugenics project and the Wellcome Trust's Codebreakers Makers of Modern Genetics project, um, both of which um, you can see on screen their, their, their website front pages. And what my plan actually is to do is to kind of contrast the investigation of genetic disability with the establishment of acquired disability through looking at um, the instigation and investigation of compensation practices in Britain during the same time period. And framing the moves made to try and classify disability as either genetic or acquired reveals the ep epistemic work that classification systems, whether statistical or compensatory, did to codify interactions between the biological and the social. So the aim is to historicize the creation of this false binary to, in order to reveal how data has been used to obscure health inequalities. But by looking um, at how it's been used to obscure the relationship between the individual, the individual and the environment. And then secondly, the aim is to reveal how disability is acting as this meta-analytic category um, that's giving further credence to, to, to categories including race and sex. But as we've seen today, these categories weren't fixed. They shifted and they fluctuated in relation to disability in the different contexts of eugenics, genetics and compensation cultures that sought to explain the causes of disability and to allocate responsibility for it. By questioning the basis of exclusion or acceptance of socioeconomic factors, we can push at the normative scientific scaffolding that supported the understanding of inheritance that emerged against the background of widespread First World War disablement and the proto-welfare state in Britain. And this context is really significant, as historians like Alex Mould have emphasised, quote, emphasising personal responsibility for health shifted liability. So the importance of socioeconomic inequality is diminished in the 20th century, just as classifications of standardised types linked to rage and age linked to race and age and sex were being elevated. So by critically engaging with the scientific processes of categorization, we can complicate the biological versus social binary 
by illuminating the cases, the people, and the experiences that blurred the borderline's limits. Untangling the determining factors that investigators use to attribute disability causation to the environment or the individual allows us to historicize this duality. So my project aims to merge disability history with the history of science to advance our thinking about how both disability and eugenics relate to this broader history of categorizing inequality. And analyzing this struggle to understand how disability and disease were added on upon the, by the environment and social conditions um, reveals the epistemological power of categories in its creation of disability as a difference that mattered and that could be counted, classified and controlled. Ruha Benjamin has shown how this process entrenches race categories in techno science by asking, quote, what social groups are classified, corralled, coerced and capitalised upon so others are free to tinker, experiment, design and engineer the future. Problematizing categories themselves emphasises their epistemic authority, their imaginative power, and most importantly, highlights disabled resistance to them. So thank you very much for listening. As I said, I'm, I'm not really yet even at the start of this project, so I really welcome comments, thoughts and suggestions, as well as questions. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, that is my email address, coin.maguire at durham.ac.uk. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter far too much. Thank you. Arafat Valiani is a medical sociologist and a historian of science and genetics. His current intellectual interests focus on questions of decolonization regarding genomics, difference, and precision medicine, especially among South Asians and other racialized peoples. His talk is entitled Maternal and Infant Health and genetic histories of post-colonial India. Okay, hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Arafat Valiani. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Oregon. Um, I wanted to thank the NHGRI for inviting me to present this paper, as well for organizing an exciting symposium with engaging panelists I've, whom I've learned a lot from. Um, what I'm going to present today is a work in progress. It's part of a larger book project on genetics and genomics as it relates to racialized communities. My focus is on South Asians. And this paper distills uh, some, but definitely not, not all my findings as I work through my archive documents. Okay, so um, we're looking at the first slide here and it's entitled Caste, Race and Colonial Knowledge. And it's an image of a survey undertaken by colonial officials. And the title is The Tribes and Castes of Bengal, Volume 1. In the study of genetics in South Asian history of science, two threads characterize the salience of race and caste with science in the 20th century. One of these threads focused on the collection of biological data, which was useful for colonial projects of knowledge. As Crispin Bates demonstrates, the first consists of phrenology, which focused on physical measurements of Indian bodies, i.e. the shape of the nose, size, and shape of the cranium, skin tone, and height. Sir H. H. Bailey is best known for institutionalizing the use of anthropometric data in order to generate racial classifications of Indians in the ethnographic survey of Bengal, which he oversaw beginning in 1885. The second thread comprises the study of blood groups and its correlation with caste in the early decades of the 20th century. Caste, in, in people have spent books defining it, but in, in short, um, one is born into a specific caste. Um, there are understandings of high and low and untouchable or Dalit castes. Um, and uh, spiritually, the or Theologically, the idea is one can change caste in the next lifetime. As Projit Mukherjee notes, phrenology grew to fall out of favor as a methodology by which to study human difference, which increasingly became associated with quote unquote error and observer bias, end quote, because humans recorded the measurements that were intrinsic to anthropometric analysis. In the early 20th century, the discovery of blood types in 1901 seemed to offer a more analytical seem to offer more analytical purchase as a scientific methodology by which to accurately study, quote, human bodily difference, end quote. 
The study of blood types was taken up in earnest after almost two decades of the discovery of blood types by the Polish bacteriologist and serologist Ludwig Hertzfeld and his wife, Anna Hertzfeld. Both of them worked as volunteers in the medical service in Greece. During their tenure there, they observed that proportions of blood types varied by race, with type B predominating among Indian and African troops. Further, the Hersfelds speculated that blood types A and B had different points of origin, with the latter originating from India, which they claimed was the cradle of one part of humanity. Published in The Lancet in 1919, their findings suggest that the highest frequency of type B occurred among Indian soldiers whom, in their view, constituted a distinct biochemical race. But where does the study of human difference go after India's independence from the British in 1947? Did the prospect of the end of colonial rule and the racial sciences which underpinned it produce novel directions in biomedical research in post-colonial India? Did Indian medical researchers strive to decolonize the gaze of the human sciences, though they remain dependent on European scientific discourses even after 1947? And did they center concerns about disability and health in its place? Okay, so now we switch to a slide. It's entitled Dr. Jerusha Girard. Um, I'm gonna describe who she was. She practiced between uh, 1914 and 1968. I want to suggest that the focus shifted in the post-colonial period toward the clinic and public health concerns, which went, which went beyond explicit articulations of caste, race, and health. The utility of gen genetics in particular between 1947 and the 1980s lay in the insights it would shed on inherited conditions. Not only would this provide a modicum of preventative patient care, which was absent at the time in India, it could also be incorporated into medical training for students and existing physicians like pediatricians and obstetricians. The clinic and around it are the sites on which I would like to concentrate in this presentation, particularly the work of female gynecologists and obstetricians whose field was growing in post-colonial India in the area of maternal and infant health. I will situate my characterization of the growth of the field beginning with Dr. Jerusa Girad, Born into a Jewish family in, this, in uh, Mysore, South India, she educated herself from the age of 11 on merit scholarships, completing her college training at Grant Medical College in 1912. As the first recipient of a Government of India postgraduate scholarship, she began a residency at the Elizabeth Garrett Ho Ho Anderson Hospital in London, profiting from the openings created by the enlistment of male doctors during World War I. After two years of service, she applied to complete her medical degree with a specialty in gynecology and obstetrics at the University of London. After completing her degree in 1919, she returned to India but could not secure a position in Lady Kama Hospital in Bombay, which in fact was her aspiration. She filled in for another OBGYN as a locum in a practice in New Delhi and then shifted to Bangalore to work at the invitation of the senior surgeon there. She was appointed as honorary surgeon at the Kama Hospital in Bombay in 1925 and became a medical officer three years later, thus fulfilling her dream. She founded the Bombay Obstetric and Gynecological Society in 1948, and two years later, she presided over the sixth All India Obstetric and Gynecological Congress, which was held in Madras. In many ways, the window onto Dr. Girard's career reflects the emergence and expansion of the field of obstetrics and gynecology between 1950 and the 1980s. This entailed maternal and infant health being subsumed within family planning strategies, which were aligned with the biodemographic development strategies of the new post-colonial state. Okay, so now we have shifted to a slide. It's entitled Indian Reformers and Eugenics. We have a photo of several grown women uh, dressed in um, uh, marriage gowns, marriage saris and marriage gowns um, in India. And um, they're, they're participating in a march. They're carrying um, flags um, that say India and crown colonies and protectorates. Before I discuss family planning in post-colonial India, I want to situate it within the particular manifestation of eugenics in 
which Indian reformers took up in the 1920s and 1930s, which is the, the period of the photo. In these decades, eugenic societies were formed throughout India, comprised as they were of urban professional men and some women, who debated the state of the Indian nation and the causes of its, quote, degeneracy. These reform-minded societies sought to identify the causes of India's social and therefore institutional, economic, and technological decline from previous, quote, imagined eras of ancient glory. As Sarah Hodges notes, while much of Indian eugenics resembled contemporary eugenics movements across the world, eugenics in India was also produced by and productive of uniquely Indian debates and circumstances. The distinguishing features of Indian eugenics were produced through the attempts to resolve the tensions created by Indian eugenicists' perceptions of an East-West divide in civilization as well as science. In particular, eugenics in India fed into and was supported by late colonial debates on national progress, scientific modernity, and most important, marriage reform. That's the end of her quote. Unlike eugenicists elsewhere, Indian eugenicists did not pressure the colonial state to promote sterilization, nor did they undertake genetic research on hereditary. This would all come later, um, as I discuss in the following sections of this paper in part. Marriage reform was the locus of these eugenicist debates and anxieties because they viewed the institution of arranging caste-based marriages between comparatively older men with girls as a consequence of dubious, though widespread sexual practices based in, quote, licentiousness, degeneration, and superstition, end quote. Again, these are their words. In the view of reformers, child marriage was the root cause of a host of social ills which included congenital differences which led to disability, sexual weakness or impotence, sterility and over-procreation, that's a quote, women's poor health, sexual perversion, and children prone to thievery or insanity. Child marriage led to quote-unquote unscientific child rearing, which lay at the heart of India's quote-unquote fall and Europe's emergence as an imperial power based on scientific in innovation. In the place of science in India's history and the notion of, quote, East versus Western science, end quote, fueled the reformers' anxieties about national progress. But because Indian eugenicists focused not on a science of gene genetics, but on the peculiarities of marriage practices, to explain and investigate the key eugenic mechanism of heredity, Eugenics was able to emerge in the writing of these eugenicists, not as a foreign import, but as part and parcel of India's cultural and scientific heritage. Indian eugenicists created a register on which one could publicly discuss sex knowledge, quote, that's in quotes, in polite company as a form of scientific rhetoric which could transparently share insights about sex and heredity, as well as questions and curiosities that much of the population was thought to have. In reality, however, the effects of Indian eugenesis culminated in the 1940s in focusing on promoting maternal and inf infant health, particularly through the introduction of contraception as a way to improve the Indian nation, which was incorporated into the family planning efforts of the post-colonial state after the British left in 1947. Okay, so now we switch to a scan of India's first five-year plan. It's just the title page and it says, first five-year plan. That's also the title of the slide. In early post-colonial India, the growing size of the Indian population became a serious concern. Family planning strategies were officially adopted as part of the first five-year plan in 1952. However, by 1960, failures in food production, lagging socio-technical development, and concerns about national security created a perfect storm with, quote, overpopulation, end quote, at, at its center. As Maiteli Srinivas suggests, growing fears of, quote, a population bomb, end quote, with its epicenter in South Asia haunted the public imagination in both India and the West. Within India, this fueled the targeting of lower caste, lower class, and Adivasi women in desperate attempts to curtail their rep reproduction. In the West, racialized discourses marked black and brown women's bodies as responsible for global overpopulation. 
paid workers and volunteers impose themselves on these communities and were empowered by the state to spread contraceptive use through quantitative targets and financial incentives for family planning. Okay, so now we've shifted to a slide entitled Genetics and Gy in Gynecology and Obstetrics. And we have a scan of the first pa page of an article that's entitled Congenital Birth Defects in Regional Medical College Hospitals, Manipur. The source is History of Medicine, 2009. Indian gynecologists and obstetricians very much allied themselves with the state in leading the charge of family planning. Its research activities focused on the study of contraception and its advocacy work centered on the legalization of, of abortion, which took place in a change in the statutes in 1971. If we, if we think of the field as having a biography, one will notice its commitment to maternal health through the rest of the 1970s, starting first with the International Seminar on Maternal Mortality, Perinatal Mortality, and Reproductive Biology, which was held in Bombay in 1969. One of the things that I haven't seen in my archival documents is discussion of um, the role of these professionals in forced sterilization. This came into being um, in the 1970s, around the mid 1970s, during the years that a state of emergency was declared under the new prime minister, Indira Gandhi. And this is probably India's most notorious period where um, forced sterilization took place on lower class and lower caste women in India. But again, it's not discussed in the, the journals that I have looked at, but I definitely intend to ask my informants about it when I collect oral histories and interviews. In the 1980s, the scope of the field expanded significantly to include areas that were associated with women's health and as well as, well as biomedical innovations. The profession began to work in the fields of infertility, genetics, endoscopy, and imaging science. Genetics, along with new diagnostic tools, concentrated on a host of conditions associated with pregnancy or prenatal detec detection of conditions, one of which was congenital birth differences. In the 1980s, congenital birth conditions were associated with close to a third of stillbirths and 7% of live births. They could include cleft palate, alimentary and GIS tract anomalies, or those of the hip, skeleton, and brain. Strikingly, studies that I interpreted do note that such conditions result in, quote, incapacities, i.e. disabilities, for newborns who survive the neonatal stage. In the sources that I reviewed so far, I'm definitely not done in this space, but this is, these are some of my observations so far. Genetic and epigenic, epigenetic factors could be discussed together. So, for example, these birth conditions are correlated with the first birth, or as in the case of lower class mothers from the fifth birth onwards. While genetic factors are acknowledged, these kinds of conditions were also correlated with the recreational use of barbiturates and dexoamphetamine. Poverty or a lack of education are also implicated with congenital conditions causing taxoplasmosis as well as smoking and alcohol consumption along with syphilis, which stigmatize and presume women's personal and sexual practices. Though not explicit, some, but certainly not all of these factors, underline social practices, which might fall outside middle class and high caste norms of some of these female gynecologists and researchers who are writing these articles. I would characterize the gynecological and obstetric research in the 1970s and 80s, which employed genetic tools focusing as it did globally on what were referred to as chromosomal differences. Medical texts that I interpreted in the 1980s read as a tutorial for gynecologists and obstetricians to collect, prepare, and analyze samples screening for a battery of conditions. The diagnostic use of family history to identify some hereditary conditions, along with banning procedures to identify, quote, structural anomalies, end quote. Many of the chromosomal differences focused on variations which generally fell into two categories. The cases being examined were missing a chromosome, so they had 45 instead of the more common 46 chromosomes. More interestingly, the other set of cases seemed to vary in their chromosomes associated with sex, 
specifically triploids, meaning cases in which three chromosomes were found, XXY, instead of the XX or XY formations. To close, the evidence of the field in the 1970s and 1980s suggests that OBGYNs writing up their clinical findings in this period appear to emphasize properly employing the methods of medical genetics in their studies, thereby increasingly making correlations between chromosomal variations and references to, quote, incapacities, end quote, which today we call disabilities. In many ways, what I've described is the emergence of the field of obstetrics and gynecology in India as a laboratory for practitioners to establish their science and field using the latest genetic techniques and chromosomal study. In this period, gynecologists and obstetricians focus on clinical work, not basic science, to address concerns in maternal and infant health, which align the field and profession with family planning policies of the state between 1960 and the 1980s. Jane Saffitz is an assistant professor of cultural and medical anthropology at Denison University in Granville, Ohio. Her talk is titled, Irreducible Alterity, Violence and Activism Surrounding Oculocutaneous Albinism Type Two in Tanzania, 1880 to 2022. This talk is called Irreducible Alterity, Violence and Activism Surrounding Oculocutaneous Albinism Type 2 in Tanzania. In November of 2015, I sat in the back of a large auditorium at the Julius Nyerere International Conference Center in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and for three days attended session after session at the first ever Pan-African Albinism Conference. Surrounding me were representatives from albinism rights organizations all across the continent, as well as journalists, scientists, ambassadors, politicians, delegates from the UN, European Union, and African Union. Um, we all tuned in with our headsets in English, French, or Swahili um, to panelists speaking to the myriad challenges faced by Africans with albinism in the last two decades. Um, the conference's theme, um, Making Attacks, Stigma, and Discrimination a Faint Memory, alluded to many of these challenges, from the complex vision problems of those with albinism and the cancer-causing rays of equatorial sun, to the spate of recent violence dubbed albinocide that has engulfed the continent since 2006. As the Canadian ambassador uh, to Tanzania reminded a crowded banquet hall the first evening. Um, rumors attesting to the supernatural potentials of albino body parts um, had given way to maiming, murdering, and grave robbing, allegedly to satisfy demand in a clandestine market for albino body parts at the hands of traditional healers and their patrons, who have been said to falsely believe in the power of albino bodies to generate wealth. This particular narrative explaining violence has circulated widely since 2006. In journalistic, academic, and humanitarian publications, across things like documentary films and young adult literature, um, transnational publics are taught that African albinism is misunderstood by Africans who ostensibly lack genetic literacy and in its place resort to superstition and fetishism deeply rooted in, quote, African tradition. At the time of the conference, I was living in Tanzania conducting ethnographic and archival research on albinism uh, full time, since this is where violence had been most acute and where the albinism rights movement was most robust. Um, there had been approximately 160 documented murders in the past 15 years. Um, and since 2012, I've spent over 30 months investigating rumors about albinism, as well as the broader narratives about violence and movement for albinism rights. This meant not only living with a family in the Mwanza region, speaking Swahili and engaging in virtually all aspects of their daily life from church to chores and from weddings to neighborhood parties. Um, it also meant conducting interviews and participant observation with albinism activists. This, this was basically humanitarians, doctors, scientists, missionaries, 
and journalists, um, people with and without albinism, Tanzanian and international, uh, as they work to spread biomedical, rights-based, and biblical understandings of human difference. So this is to say that I knew many at the conference quite well. At the same time, my research also led me to traditional healers, uh, chiefs and extractive laborers, mostly artisanal gold miners and fishermen who were maligned by these narratives about violence and who in some instances um, have used albino body parts non-biomedically, though not necessarily in ways that were violent. My approach was also historical. By conducting oral histories and using medical admission archives, as well as those kept by the British colonial government and Tanzanian state, I traced various practices of engaging albinism in ways that both accord with and exist beyond genetics. Early in the conference, the American geneticist, Dr. Murray Brilliant, explained to attendees that oculocutaneous albinism type two, the kind most common in Sub-Saharan Africa, is caused by a deletion on the P gene that results in low levels of the pigment melanin, as well as in an underdeveloped optic nerve, nystagmus or rapid eye movement, um, and sun sensitivity. Also explaining his hypothesis that being a carrier for the mutation offers some protection against leprosy, Brilliant suggested that historically people with albinism were at best socially invisible and at worst victims of infanticide, and that it was only in the mid 20th century that missionaries, doctors, and humanitarians worked to normalize beliefs about albinism. Like much of the discourse surrounding African albinism, his talk was premised on a divide between traditional healers and the, their patrons on the one hand, um, who are said to traffic in rumor and shadowy belief um, and callous to others suffering and mired in tradition, fetishize albinism um, and orchestrate violence. And then on the other hand, albinism rights activists who are said to communicate facts that enlighten rather than obscure and that counter a quote, albino fetish through liberal roads, modes of recognition rooted in models of disability and humanitarian identity politics. As a medical anthropologist charting a somewhat different course, um, my approach to albinism is not one that assumes a priori the existence of a biomedical reality to which cultural beliefs do or do not adhere. Rather, um, I approach albinism as multiple, at times instantiated as a genetic condition and at others instantiated in uh, traditional healing practices as a potent catalyst in dawa, which is a Swahili word that usually translated as medicine. Um, centering the multiplicity of albinism allowed me to develop an understanding of the fetishization of albinism that runs counter to activist discourse. So in my talk today, a queer understandings of albinocide that bifurcate an indigenous cosmology said to fetishize albinism through an occult signification um, from medical epistemologies that are said to emanate from outside Africa, elucidate the, elucidate the nature of difference and undergird humanitarian responses. By historicizing albinism at the intersection of multiple historical genealogies and epistemologies, I argue that violence and activism are not only co-constitutive, but enabled by shared histories of encounter that account for their fetishization at the hands of traditional healers and geneticists alike. On day two of the conference, well-known activists, among them the Kenyan Justice Grace, Grace Ngugi, uh, the disability rights attorney and, and Tanzanian ambassador to Germany, Abdallah Pass, and the Canadian businessman and founder of the NGO under the same son, Peter Ash, um, debated the relative advantages of legal classifications of disability. While particular countries, including Tanzania, had already enshrined albinism as a disabling condition, this debate centered albinism organizing at the UN, where earlier that year, activists had successfully petitioned for the creation of 
an independent expert on albinism. Um, she goes by I, I.K. Arrow. Um, and, and this was a move that led to an official classification of albinism as a, quote, specific people group. So there are around 50 working groups designated to advocating either for marginalized groups like the elderly or internally displaced people, um, or for um, specific issues prone to human rights violations like torture or trafficking. Um, as Peter Ash explained um, at this panel, the UN treats designations of disabled and specific people group as mutually exclusive. Um, given this, he, um, he explained that his organization preferred the latter specific people group for it more aptly described the plight of Africans with albinism. He elaborated, uh, for my brothers and sisters with albinism in Africa, their biggest problems aren't bodily. They are the bogus spiritual beliefs and the fact that African traditions don't understand albinism. So rather than claim status as disabled then, he argued for recognition on the basis of their fetishization, their irreducible alterity, their irreducible difference at the hands of unknowing others. Over the following months, I dwelled on Ash's claims as I tried to unravel exactly who might be fetishizing albinism, in what ways, and for what ends. For him and many others, violence resulted from uh, the mystification of their genetic condition, which he attributed to African tradition, um, like activist, academic, and journalistic explanations of violence, um, his, his, his premise rested on linear narratives with very clearly delineated causes and effects, as well as on binary oppositions between occult violence and humanitarian activism. And yet, I found the waters surrounding albinism far murkier. For instance, uh, by working through the publications of late 19th and early 20th century biometricians and eugenicists, I came to see a centuries-old Euro-American enthrallment with African albinism. This literature builds on the work of Enlightenment naturalists and philosophers who experimented with the bodies of Africans of albinism. They did things like display them at ethnological exhibitions and private medical events across Europe, um, and in effect created a European market for albino body parts. Budding notions of race in the late 19th century um, surely contributed to Europeans' preoccupation with albinism, since the mere presence of, quote, white Africans confounded racial categories and suggested something of their potential malleability. In my work, I trace such fixations, and you could call them fetishizations, um, through the 19th century, when the professionalization and institutionalization of biomedical sciences meant that an increasing number of experts, from ophthalmologists and dermatologists to pathologists and surgeons, set out to explain aberrant whiteness among Africans. Um, the biometrician Carl Pearson, for instance, in his monograph on albinism in man, sought further knowledge of the frequency and inheritance patterns of albinism. To this end, he compiled pedigree charts, ethnological data, medical reports, hair and skin samples, travelogues, and photographs. And while he was unable to develop a generalized theory of albinism, um, his text not only called for more data um, in the way of albino organs and tissue samples, it was also peppered with conjectures about the inability of Africans to assimilate difference. Citing anecdotes from missionaries, traders, and colonial medical officers, he wrote of British East Africa, the natives, Dr. Stannis says, have no special word for albino. They are not accounted for in any special way. They say they have just been sent by Mlunga, a word which embraces unknown powers. Probably they were killed from time to time at birth. I bring this up first to highlight that Africans with albinism have long been central to the production of biomedical knowledge surrounding albinism, 
and that Euro-Americans have long been central to the production of albinism's occult signification, an observation that makes untenable any neat distinction between the elucidating knowledge of biomedicine and the supposed obscurantist beliefs of healers. Secondly, um, I want to underscore a Western anxiety surrounding albinism that has, um, in my estimation, been projected onto Africans and that Tanzanians specifically are patently aware of. So through interviews with elderly chiefs, for example, I learned that um, since early colonial encounters, late 1800s, um, early 1900s, many Tanzanians have found curious the value that African albino bodies appear to hold for others, um, not only scientists and missionaries, but now, for instance, humanitarians, journalists, and anthropologists. Often during my field work, interlocutors ask me what doctors in my country were doing with albino body parts, suggesting that it might actually be Westerners facilitating violence in a market for albino body parts, not Africans. Thirdly, this Euro-American fetishization of albinism has only intensified in the decades since Pearson's work, whether in the 1930s when the British created a new Swahili word for albino, uh, in the 1950s when missions built schools for children with albinism, or in the 1970s during the height of Tanzanian socialism when Dar es Salaam received its first radiation machine and oncologists finally able to treat skin cancers began going door to door, searching for people with albinism to count in censuses and enroll in clinical trials. Organizing led to the creation of the Tanzanian Albinism Society, which um, was funded then by the socialist state and now by international disability rights organizations. Um, and it aimed to instantiate albinism as a medico legal humanitarian category. And in the 1980s, during the UN's Decade of Disabled Persons, successfully advocated for a national definition of disability inclusive of albinism. This flurry of activity did not solidify albinism as a particular kind of subject object, but rather led to proliferating questions about the ontological and epistemological status of albinism and about who finds what valuable and why. Throughout the 20th century, transdisciplinary literature on African albinism abounded, always with piecemeal anecdotes about African beliefs. For instance, a 1979 publication by the Swedish anthropologist Stuart Lagerkrantz uh, drew heavily on Pearson's work, citing many of the same missionaries and travelers who alleged that people with albinism were sacrificed, their flesh, quote, an ingredient in potions. Spanning 300 years from Morocco to Lesotho to Ethiopia, he constructed a general narrative about the occult signification of albinism across Africa, wherein their anomalous nature was, quote, fetishized. While it may seem that organizing at the UN or publishing academic literature would not inform a rural healer's practice surrounding the use of particular ingredients, Activists like the retired oncologist, uh, Dr. Jeff Luande, understand that collective efforts to make uh, the category albinism visible also enabled violence. As he explained from his offices at the Ocean Road Cancer Institute after the conference, people with albinism, quote, became visible to the wrong people. The entangled and co-constitutive nature of albinism, act, violence and activism became clearer to me when, for instance, Violence intensified following a 2009 report by the Red Cross that, quoting a police officer, stated that a full set of albino body parts is worth 75,000 US dollars, a statistic that has been reproduced hundreds of times in the years since. Confusion surrounding the demand for albino body parts became even more palpable when every so often someone would be arrested for harboring an albino bone and it would come out that they were trying unsuccessfully to locate a buyer. That is, they were acting on the presumption of someone else's demand. Layered together then, entangled knowledge practices surrounding albinism from genetics to healing and in Bibles to UN charters um, suggest the need for far more nuanced understandings of how a genetically defined minoritized population 
becomes valuable. In the Q&A following the conference, um, a doctor from the Central African Republic commented that people with albinism were twice disabled, once by equatorial sun and low vision, and again by a society that misunderstands difference. Yet others pushed back against Ash's claims, arguing that international recognition as, di as disabled enabled important protections. Ash admitted to the difficulty in classifying albinism. We are not a racial group, he said, we are not all disabled, but stigma is everywhere and this is what unites us. So what then do we make of an international classification based on what Ash's organization calls the mystical nature of albinism? For one, it seems that any claims of fetishization must be located in the interstitial space between biomedicine and African forms of healing, as well as between binaries of activism and violence, fact and rumor, Europe and Africa, visibility and concealment. It also seems that attempts to remedy violence by further partitioning knowledge systems and practices, evinced by activists' recent efforts to further criminalize non-biomedical healing in Tanzania, um, perhaps miss that motives behind violence may be far murkier than reported on, and thus that solutions must adequately capture this complexity. In this context, the UN's inability to recognize more than one designation notwithstanding, I wonder what it might mean for albinism rights activists to lean into the multiplicity of albinism and the entangled encounters that have enabled its overvaluation. That is, perhaps by beginning from a premise that neither genetic explanations of difference nor medical legal classifications of disability necessarily elucidate, and by accepting that non-biomedical understandings of albinism are not inherently violent, stakeholders of all kinds might begin to quell some of the spectacle that has surrounded people with albinism for centuries, and for once allow a minoritized population to live with difference among others. Thank you. This is Christopher Donahue speaking. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Neil Hanchard, our moderator for the next question and answer session. Dr. Hanchard is a senior investigator within NHGRI's Center for Precision Health Research and the head of the Childhood Complex Disease Genomics section. Dr. Hanchard received his MD from the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica, after which he was awarded the Jamaica Rhodes Scholarship to the University of Oxford in the UK. There he completed a DPhil in human genetics and clinical medicine, where he worked on population differentiation, genome variation, and natural selection in the major histocompatibility complex. His research has provided insight to the population genetics of the mutation that causes sickle cell disease, identified novel genes in the development of congenital cardiovascular disorders and rare Mendelian disorders, and has made inroads to understanding the pathogenesis of diabetic embry embryopathy, severe childhood malnutrition, and transfusion alloimmunization in sickle cell disease. Over to you, Dr. Hanchard. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been a real uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, the the papers that were presented today were were just truly astounding um, and really sort of concretize, you know, some of the, some of the stickier points um, as it relates to genetics and, and the irreducible subjects. Um, so I do want to just have a, just a reminder for people to put their questions in the question and answer um, or send via the email that's in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, I thought maybe we could uh, kick things off just by having each of the speakers um, just sort of sort of reintroduce themselves. You know, we've had three back to back to back um, very quickly um, and, and give some of their self description. And I'm going to start with Dr. Valiani. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Hanchard, and thank you to. Um, the organiz organizers at NHGRI and um, University of SUNY Buffalo for organizing this um, amazing symposium. 
Um, I am uh, Arifat Valiani. Um, I'm a South Asian man. I have salt and pepper hair uh, parted to one side, and I'm wearing a um, orange t-shirt representing um, reconciliation, which was the previous Monday uh, for Indigenous communities. Um, and I'm wearing a, a, a charcoal colored shirt over it with a Mandarin collar. Great, so I will go to Dr. McGuire. Hello there, I'm Corinne. I'm a white woman with dark hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a white blazer. And my office is in the background. Dr. Safitz. Hi, I'm Jane Safitz. Um, I am a white woman with brown hair, um, a gray button down shirt and big round glasses. Thank you so much. And I am Neil Hanchard. I am a male of African Caribbean heritage, wearing a blue shirt, a dark gray jacket and have a blank background. So um, there is one question that's come up in the Q&A. Um, and Belinda Spinosi says, as a co-sharer of the MCR1, MC1R gene, with some of those with albinism, there has been research suggesting that the reason why people with red hair in Northern Europe migrated were for the same reasons. And I wonder, what are the migration patterns of people with albinism? And do they find better success elsewhere? And what kind of success does that look like? And that seems like a question um, to Dr. Safitz. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> from my understanding, um, and, and I'll speak only about oculocutaneous albinism type two, um, the mutation originated in West Africa prior to uh, the Bantu migration. So like prior to the spread of um, different language groups who moved across West Africa into Eastern and Southern Africa around 5,000 years ago. Um, this makes albinism or oculocutaneous albinism type two far more prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa than in say Europe or North America. Um, and it has also meant that there is a, a larger percentage of people with albinism in the US who are of African ancestry. Um, at least in Africa, there are not really places where folks have necessarily fared better since um, equatorial sun tends to be um, a difficult you know, issue for people to face across the continent. Um, and since recently violence has occurred in around I think 25 or 27 different countries in Africa. So in North America, the, the problems of skin cancer are, are much less severe, um, but there are other challenges related to low vision, stigma, um, and discrimination. Thank you, Dr. Safitz. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a question for Dr. McGuire um, you know, as a clinical geneticist, we learn about uh, Julia Bell's classifications. And so we're sort of very familiar with her and how well those classifications are actually translated to um, the genetic um, variation that underlies some of them, particularly for uh, short fingers or brachydactyly, as it's called. My question, however, was that um, you point to disability that was not necessarily viewed as disability by the persons who, to whom this was sort of like put on um, when you talked about the blue sclerotics. And I wondered whether you had a projection about what disability history might say about the current period where, as we do a lot of this um, sequencing, for instance, in advance, you might identify someone who is not, is sort of asymptomatic or perhaps pre-symptomatic um, or, you know, you might ascribe someone a risk for something that's only going to happen much later in life. And in the same kind of vein about people pushing back, do you think that we'll end up in a similar kind of situation? Um, and what might be the consequences of that? 
Thank you. That's such a great question. And that's definitely um, close to the lines around um, which I've been thinking well, when developing this project, which is partly why I spoke about the, the mother when I started the presentation, because one of the things I am really interested in is how this was for other members of the family um, carrying their recessive genes, whether they then considered themselves disabled or, um, or, or not, and what it was like sort of waiting to see if something was going to happen or not. So it's the kind of relationality that I think is especially interesting and maybe something that is just starting to be explored um, more in disability history. Uh, David Turner and Daniel Blackie in particular have done a lot of work on um, families and connections. I'd love to know more actually about uh, how much you are talk about, taught about Julia Bell because there's not a great deal of, of work about her, but she was obviously completely prolific. And she's also a really interesting figure when you're in discussions with people that try and make this really strong cutoff between eugenics and genetics. But of course, she was there. <laughs> it, you know, she's a good example of the, of the point that it's a lot of the same people. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Um, yes, and and you know, I don't, I don't think it's a general teaching, but certainly any time we've had a patient who had brachydactyly, we had to learn about Bell's classification and and, and work through it from there. Um, th thank you very much. So there's another question in the Q&A, which is for, for Dr. Valiani, asking whether there is any difference in stigmatization in genetic diseases and disabilities within the caste hierarchy, or any difference in health accessibility. Hi, yes, thanks for that question. Um, yes, there is. Um, the work of Michelle Friedland, for example, demonstrates um, uh, challenges to accessibility, um, particularly um, for people who hear differently uh, in India. And I think recently she has written about how um, new partnerships with private providers um, uh, complicates um, accessibility to um, accessing um, hearing aids, but also even just the new kinds of hearing aids that are supported, um, uh, the kind of uh, medical support that's needed for it and the technical support that's needed. That's, um, th there, there are huge differences in terms of accessibility, um, uh, in large part because they're such, they're so, it's expensive, right? And um, so, for the large majority of the population, um, which is below the middle class, um, that that is a challenge to accessibility. Um, stigmatization in genetic diseases and disability uh, within caste. Um, so it's it's kind of double edged. I would say, I mean, it, the thing with caste is that it's its um, differences are not, are not tolerated well. I mean, it is, it is a hierarchy based on um, fixing differences into castes, right? So it's, it's very much about, in some ways you could say, every caste below the high ones are stigmatized. So, um, you know, if you have a, a disease or a disability, um, I think that can be, that can compound um, your differences. Um, but I have to say that at the same time, um, interpersonally, there is a, um, my experience has been that for the most part, there's also um, a lot of compassion. So if you have a disability, um, just interpersonally, um, you know, I think you, what you see is um, people try to accommodate someone who's disabled. Um, it depends on the kind of disability as well. Um, so um, I think that, yeah, in, in a way, you know, just uh, I'm talking in terms of sociability. So person to person interaction in the street um, or like within us, within like family or among friends, um, 
yes, there, there's, there's a certain kind of awareness when it comes to um, disability um, that um, in some ways is more pronounced than I've experienced um, in other places in the world. Um, but again, it depends on the disability and also it depends on the social group you're with. Um, so that's, that's how I would answer that. Thanks for the question. Um, great. And I'm, I'm going to say one question of my own from Dr. 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 Safitz, which, you know, is more of a curiosity question, but I just kind of had to ask, um, which is that you sort of noted that there is some aspect of the fetishism of, of albinism that was sort of brought um, to Africa. And I wondered whether that extended to any of the um, animals where you know, sort of rhinos and crocodiles and so on, who all have albinism and whether that extends there as well, or, or is it more sort of like how it used to be where it's just, you know, a different type of animal? Thanks, sure. Um, so I found that um, certainly animal, various animals with albinism were central to um, like the research on the genetics of albinism, certainly. That was not as much picked up on by Africans, um, especially because many work very, very strongly to draw like a strict separation between humans and other animals. Um, but that has actually in recent years changed um, because one of the strategies that activists employ is to, um, they, you know, in their seminars where they teach, um, you know, re about recessive inheritance, they show pictures of like an albino crocodile, an albino tiger. Um, they show pictures of like families with albinism all around the world as a way of trying to normalize the condition and say, hey, this is something that occurs um, in people all over the world, um, in, in all different kinds of species. Um, and so it's a very recent tactic, um, probably just in the last 15 years, um, mostly as a way of, of, of trying to point out albinism as genetic. Fascinating. Um, great, so I, I also wanted to sort of have a more, a more general question, um, which is that all of you, have referred to um, policies or actions or events that in, in some ways were sort of forced upon groups and it created um, these kinds of uh, categorizations which then fed into sort of the eugenics uh, idea about sort of feeble-mindedness, et cetera. And um, I wondered whether from a historian's standpoint, you view that these actions uh, rise to the level of needing an apology, a formal apology. This is something that is now very prevalent within, you know, a number of different societies, genetic societies and others. Um, and if so, from whom, um, whether it should be the state or the medical establishment broader or, or others, um, and I just kind of wanted to get your, your take on that. Um, so I'll start with Dr. McGuire and we can maybe all go around. Uh, that, that's another really interesting question <laughs> um, that I have thought about less. But I would say there is attempts in the UK to do this kind of work. It's a little bit more difficult to see where it should come from because I mean, eugenics was such a pervasive ideology that suffused through all different kinds of um, classes and parts of, of society. Um, I know that, as I mentioned on one of the slides, there's this legacies of eugenics projects at UCL. And I think they may have done um, something like a formal apology or statement or Professor Joe Kane at least has been leading on that. And I think that's been, I think it was a good statement. I'm not sure how well received it was by the university, <laughs> but it, it's, and they've, they've renamed a lot of their buildings um, as part of that. Um, but of course, UCL isn't the only location where this was happening. The work that I'm looking at um, was funded by the Medical Research Council, uh, which is 
partly funded by the state but independent of the state at that time so again it's a little bit difficult to know of course the medical research council are still working and funding um so it would be interesting to think about uh how, how that would work and i think you know what's really interesting about this work is kind of complicating the history of eugenics and really showing um, how much it infiltrated into two scientific work um, one of the things that have really inspired me is Marian Schmidt's work in the US where she looked at how um, these kind of uh, proto-geneticists or, or, or eugenicists were, were trying to help people to continue to have deaf children if they were in deaf families and I haven't really found anything like that so far but there are people like Maria Kaladi working at UCL on Lionel Penrose, who I think is trying to make the argument that he's really articulating a kind of rudimentary version of the social model. So mm. that's really interesting to me. Um, I like looking at the sort of grey areas in this work. Um, but for me, what's most exciting is looking at the trying to find the voices of the disabled people themselves. and. You know, it, it just kind of links into your last question, but it, it's clear that the people like Julia Bell were careful not to let the families know what they were doing. Um, and if they kind of, she says something like, if there's any hint of a whisper or a whisper of that, then they have to kind of retreat because then they know they're not going to get straight answers from them. But there's definitely evidence, I think, from her visits that <sighs> sometimes these families were just having fun with the researchers. Uh, there's a very funny extended discussion where she's trying to speak to them about whether or not they have large heads in the family and the kids are all saying oh yeah dad he can't he can't get a hat yeah <laughs> and it's, it's very clear to me that they're they're kind of making fun of her but she, she's you know diligently recording all of this data as important data um so we'll see where it goes but thank you for the yeah. question and i'll keep thinking about that yeah that's fascinating um dr valiani and uh, you know there's there's always a lot of colonial tension as someone who's from a former colonial state as well. Yeah, I mean, I I, I mentioned um, uh, in my paper um, a certain kind of eugenics articulation uh, that focused on child marriage, um, but but the rest of the paper focused on the post-colonial period. And, you know, in, in most of the cases, well, I would say particularly for the, the post-colonial period, the things I looked at really um, focused on um, lower class, lower caste and minorities in India. And so the, the thing is, is that um, an apology assumes that these onslaughts um, uh, are over. And, but the, un, the unfortunate reality is they're not. I mean, um, forced sterilization maybe isn't taking place um, as it did during the emergency in 1975. Um, and so, um, uh, but I think just to, to survive and live for um, these groups is still very, very difficult, if not more difficult um, now than before. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there, there's an opening actually for an apology because many of the problems are still occurring. Uh, yeah. um, so I'm, I'm going to shift and sort of combine uh, the, there's an attendee question in, in the chat um, with a sort of broader idea, um, which is how we think about disability as an identity versus disability as a clinical state. Um, and it, how do we make our discussions of disabilities and the reality of disabilities more nuanced? Um, and that sort of relates a little bit to the, to the question that's there is that one idea is, you know, do we just need to involve a broader group of support um, in how we interact and in how as physicians or, or medical geneticists, we um, you know, counsel patients or we, we speak to patients, does it just need to be broader? Is, it, is there something that needs to be at a, at a completely different level of discourse um, to, in order to make it 
you know, a more to sort of capture the complexity that everybody has really talked about today. And I'll, I'll start with Dr. Safitz because you sort of alluded to this a little bit when you talked about, you know, the, the many, you know, taking a step back and, and not viewing this as just like a genetic disorder that then has these sort of um, traditional beliefs on top of it, um, but taking this sort of multi-centric view. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, there's currently in Tanzania and elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, fairly comprehensive teams of providers working on um, things like access to sunscreen, um, wearing protective clothing, screening early for skin cancers. Um, the, the low vision problems tend to be really, really complex. So there are like, caravans of ophthalmologists that come um, and teams of psychiatrists. Um, so, so within like a, within biomedicine, it, it is certainly comprehensive. Um, part of what I would like to argue is that that's insufficient in so far as um, the kind of spectacle surrounding albinism exists not within any one particular medical system or any particular one like geography or epistemology, but in the entanglement between them. So I, I would say that, you know, the, the current position of most activists is to treat traditional healers, you know, non-biomedical healers as precisely the problem um, and refuse any kind of interaction with them, which I think is difficult considering their prevalence in the country and the, the relative paucity of biomedical doctors or the distance that some people have to travel to doctors. Um, they're trying to criminalize traditional healing further. And while I understand the impetus to that, um, I think that a, like a more comprehensive approach across multiple medical systems, across different instantiations of albinism, actually like embracing the multiplicity would actually do more to reduce violence and improve health outcomes um, than, than remaining like firmly entrenched within a particular way of knowing. That's um, that's a that's a really interesting answer um, and and really well said. And I wondered whether any of the other panelists felt, or how how the other or how our other panelists felt, but also sort of is that uh, you know is that something that's a, that thought process sort of unique to the sort of OCA albinism type of. Um, situation that, that has currently been set up, or is it something that you know is is true? You know, sort of broadly across all of the you know the many disorders that have been discussed today. Um, so I, I'm just going to leave that one open. <laughs> Anybody kind of throw that out if you'd like to. Well, I have I have something short to say. Um, if you notice in my paper, I didn't, um, um, the, the word I used for congenital birth differences was differences, but uh, the actual, the clinical word in the scholarship is actually defects. So I think, you know, one of the problems is the fact that, um, that, and I think this was mentioned in, in this panel and the previous panel is that there's such a strong ableist set of assumptions within the medical community. So, you know, when you use that language to begin with, um, it, it gives away the, what the approach is, right? Which is a deficit model. Somehow you are different from the, the typical archetypal body. And I think that's where the problem starts actually, because, um, you know, the, no one really fits with that um, atyp that typical or archetypal able body. No one is completely actually able. Um, there, there are degrees and variations. And so I think that that's an important starting point um, in the language and the approach um, is to be aware of the ableist assumptions. And then, you know, and I think, you know, our keynote speaker, um, Jay, like, you know, one of the interesting things 
and tragic things, but it's also inspiring is the resistance of uh, communities that hear differently have had to um, ableist assumptions about um, you know what a what sh what an he what a hearing aid should um, what is it ex exactly aiding right because first of all it, it's it the arrogance of someone who can hear which uh, you know especially with the latest iteration of the technology that they understand what uh, someone who's hearing disabled hears and how they hear, um, right, it is, is really, is, is very problematic. So I think, you know, that's, that's also like a, an example of, of how this, this has been challenged, you know, um, in an organized way um, to, you know, just the assumptions and therefore the treatments and the technologies that could provide accommodations, right? It's not to say accommodations um, aren't desired, it, it should be given as a choice, but you know, how those get designed, um, what exactly, what exactly the difference is, those are all things that um, I think have to be interrogated um, for their, like the ableist assumptions behind them. I, you know, I, I don't think anyone could say it better. That was fantastic. I, you know, I especially like that idea that, um, you know, if there are, if there are things that are available for, you know, whatever utility that that remains a choice um, and that there's no judgment placed upon that choice um, uh, as a starting point. Um, so we are just about out of time, but I did want to um, just have Dr. Sapitz answer one other question that's in the Q&A, which is whether the sort of milder uh, version of albinism, so type three albinism, where the, the, the skin coloring, uh, the lack of pigment is not as pronounced as type two, um, and is there, do they have the same issues? It's a great question. Um, there, so there's the prevalence of, um, of uh, like, yes, multiple kinds of albinism, including just ocular albinism, um, which is much, much rarer than OCA2. Um, those with, with partial pigment, um, it's, it's interesting because the, the activist discourse leads us to believe that, you know, like most Tanzanians are incredibly dark skinned and most people with albinism are incredibly light skinned such that there's a really dramatic juxtaposition that is partly responsible for violence. The reality is there are a lot of people with partial pigment um, and there are a lot of Tanzanians who are light skinned and it's, it's very often not really clear who has albinism and who doesn't, it's often not something that um, a family necessarily notices or even has any sort of questions about until the child goes to school and has vision problems. Um, that's what tends to turn people on to the, like the presence of albinism. Um, so, th so those with more melanin tend to fare better in terms of sun protection and better in terms of, of violence, but, but not, not necessarily and not across the board. It, it really varies. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been so enlightening um, and so informative. Um, so, so thank you again, and I'm going to hand back over to Chris to sort of take us out. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hanshard, um, Corrine, Arafat, Jane, for this really, I think, important discussion um, that I think our audiences have really benefited a great deal from. We uh, will be on, and also thank you to our interpreters and our captioners as well. Uh, we will be on break for the next hour until two o'clock. Uh, please join us then, and thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to our captioners and our interpreters. Take care, everyone. <laughs>